During the past few months of market volatility, the banking sector has been in particular focus. To provide a view on what the future holds for this extremely important sector, and will the coming decade be any different, we have Mr. Tamal Bandopadhyay, a leading business columnist. Now published in Business Standard, Mr. Bandopadhyay's weekly column, Bankers Trust, dissects, analyzes, and anticipates major developments in Indian banking and financial sector. He has authored four books, namely, From Lehman to Demonetization, A Decade of Disruptions, Reforms, and Misadventure, Bandhan, The Making of a Bank, Sahara, The Untold Story, and A Bank for the Buck. He is a contributor to the Oxford Companion to Economics in India, the first comprehensive compendium of short essays covering a vast range of themes relating to Indian economy. He has also written on the banking sector reforms in Making of New India, Transformation under Modi government. LinkedIn, the global professional network, nominated Mr. Bandopadhyay as one of the top voices in finance globally for three successive years, that is 2015, 2016, and 2017. Thinkers Magazine has listed him one of the top 50 influential minds that have made indelible contributions in the field of economics and governance in India in 2017. He is a frequent speaker in India and overseas on subjects related to banking and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tamal Bandopadhyay. Um. Well, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, evolution of banking sector, will the coming decade be different? That's the subject I'm asked to talk a little bit of, on that. Uh, so I will speak a bit and then we'll have a conversation with a few of you. Uh, let's go back uh, uh, sometime last year. I think it was 15th October, 2019. In Columbia University, uh, at the Columbia University, our finance minister, Nirmala Sitaraman was talking about on Indian economy prospects and challenges. So she had her prepared speech. And after that, there was a conversation with the audience. Uh, so one of the gentlemen, uh, probably a student, he stood up and he mentioned uh, a lecture delivered by Dr. Raghuram Rajan at Brown University. And he said that Rajan has apparently said, this Indian government is extremely centralized and the leadership does not appear to have consistent, so on and so forth. And that's why the economic growth is not happening. And he, he asked uh, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman her views on that. Uh, Ms. Sitaraman uh, was very calm and composed. And she said that, well, Rajan has done a, great, a good job as a governor in terms of cleaning up the bank balance sheet. But uh, the phase under Dr. Rajan as governor and prime minister, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh is the worst banking phase in India. So let's start, uh, since we are talking about evolution of banking, who killed Indian banking? Uh, is it Rajan and Manmohan Singh combined in the recent past? Or were the seeds sown sometime in 1990s when we actually dismantled the development financial institutions? You know, uh, so the banks were pushed to uh, project lending with the banks did not know how to do it. So we didn't have the development financial institutions by, by late 90s. We, we closed it and banks were given, uh, given the task of uh, which they are not up to it. And then simultaneously, we have not seen a right kind of development in the corporate bond market. It continues to remain shallow even now. Uh, yet another factor is the takeout financing, which never took off. So if that's the background, that could be one set of reasons why we are in a set of bad, uh, uh, you know, it's not in the best of health. Other thing could be there are many people believe that the so-called irrational exuberance between 2006 and 2009, when Dr. Reddy was the RBI governor, the golden era of economy, the Indian economy, seeds were sown at that point of time because we had low inflation, 
we had relatively low fiscal deficit, we have 9% plus growth, and we have fabulous credit growth with, I think, one particular year more than three times the GDP growth. So is it, is it, it is also, I mean, is it the contributing factor to what's happening on that phase? Or yet another reason could be people say that the ultra loose monetary policy post Lehman collapse. Our policy rate came to its historic low. Of course, now it is even lower than that. And then the entire system was slush with money and corporates uh, were encouraged to, uh, to borrow uh, more and more. So essentially what corporate India did, they were substituting debt, uh, equity with debt. So we got to a situation where uh, banks were not in the best of health, but they were hiding. And then uh, uh, under Dr. Raghuram Rajan's uh, governorship, Reserve Bank of India first set up the Krillik database where they started looking at the data at a comprehensive way on a real time basis across all banks. So one particular uh, account, which is uh, on, on A bank A book was pretty good standard on bank B it was substandard, on bank C it was loss assets, so on and so forth. That's what it happened. It happened between, two, I mean, in the second half of 2015, there, um, the Krillik data, I mean, the Reserve Bank of India had a look at this and decided uh, what you called uh, a first of its kind uh, cleanup uh, exercise in India called asset quality review. Essentially, uh, Reserve Bank of India team of inspectors swooped on to the, all the banks, um, the major banks uh, balance sheets, and they told them what is to be done. And it followed it up saying that, look, if there is any discrepancy, if there's any difference between what you have, what you guys have, uh, have declared as non-performing assets and what my inspectors have seen, then you are a listed entity, you need to tell the market. So if the banks were, uh, they were given six quarter uh, till 2017 March to come up clean uh, and declare whatever their, uh, you know, whatever the bad assets were there. Uh, banks started doing that, uh, but 2017 March, we did not see the entire cleanup exercise getting over. It spilled over. And uh, by that time, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a pretty bad situation. Uh, banks had no choice but to come up clean and Reserve Bank of India, after Governor Rajan left, um, there was no let off in the uh, central bank's push. Uh, his successor, Dr. Ujit Patel, even with renewed energy and vigor, uh, continued to start, continue, continued with the cleanup exercise, uh, so on and so forth. And at that point of time, we also found that India came up with, uh, at a very fast pace, uh, the insolvency law. Uh, banks are cleaning up their balance sheets. Their NPAs are going up. Uh, so we need to we need to find a platform because all the platforms which have historically been used from 1990s, starting with BIFR, Board for Industrial and Financial Reconstruction, to through various things, CDR and so on and so forth, they are not working. Uh, so uh, IBC came in in the picture 2016. It got president's uh, approval. Um, to an IBC came in the picture, and that's what that was the time when when the um, huge cleanup uh, started happening. Uh, that was happening in the in in the banking segment, but at the same time, what you find is this because of the structural issues, uh, the problem with the banking sector spilled over uh, into the non-banking segment in 2018. Now, what happened? India embraced demonetization. Uh, whether it's good or bad, enough debate, uh, enough discussion has happened. I'm not getting into that. But uh, one offshoot of demonetization was a lot of, lot of money. There's a system was flush with liquidity. What you call technically, there's a liquidity sugar rush. And banks, because they were saddled with NPAs, uh, many of the banks, particularly in the public sector, I think 11 of them were under so-called PCA prompt corrective actions, they were not allowed to, they were not, they were at quarantine. Uh, there was no COVID there, but because of bad loans, banks were quarantined, they were not allowed to give fresh loans. And NBFCs were enough incentives, they started borrowing short because uh, India's uh, policy rate and overall interest rate, particularly the shorter end was pretty pretty low at that point of time and they are building and they are building their assets because banks were not lending to others but they are lending to NBFCs and banks were so there was a huge it's a sort of in football what you call it walkover 
uh, in, in the game. So banks were not playing their role, particularly the public sector banks. And uh, NBFC got there. And they, were, they made the classic mistake, uh, which, uh, which is the cause of the fall of Northern Rock in UK, uh, borrowing short and lending long. Uh, they were continuously borrowing short term money from the, through the CPs, uh, commercial papers, and lending long. And uh, you know, it had, come to, um, the, it had come to an end sometime 2018 happened when RBI started raising the rates. Uh, then, the, then the music stopped and the dancing also stopped. There's a, enough liquidity in the system. We had the problem in the non-banking segment. And that was the kind of situation in 2018. Um, and credit uptake was not happening. Economic growth, of course, even before COVID, we had the problem because banking sector was pretty ugly. Uh, and then IBC came in. IBC came in. Uh, there are it, uh, there are many uh, there, there are many. Uh, it, it has not had a good run in that sense, not a smooth run, and it's bound to happen because this is a trial and error process. Uh, Indian corporations, um, many of them, they know how to game the system, uh, so it's fraught with uh, many many court cases and many other issues. Uh, and that's how it happened. Um, so it's taking longer than what the IBC law says uh, it should take, uh, so on and so forth. It's not in a very, 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 uh, not in a very best of thing. But what happened is these banks are, IBC per se may not be that effective, which we wanted to have, but banks have, have started using IBC as a tool, uh, as a tool to, to, to actually uh, scare the corporations to scare the promoters. You know, they are, they are afraid of losing their empire, which has never happened before. So in the, uh, while, while IBC cases are taking time uh, to get settled and the uh, recovery rate is not as great as it could, it could have been better. But at the same time, uh, uh, what is happening is the bankers have been using IBC uh, as a tool, as a threat uh, to bring the, uh, the promoters to the discussion table, which it was not happening earlier. And many of the cases are getting uh, outside IBC the settlement. Uh, and other part is this: if you if you see the cost of uh, recovery is on on the international standard as a, as a percentage, uh, what is what is what is being spent uh, for, on this platform? Uh, so it's a it's a mixed thing. It's uh, IBC is not exactly uh, a great success, but uh, it's on the right way you are. So that was the kind of situation where uh, Reserve Bank of India. Uh, were concerned and there was actually, we, we almost uh, had a situation where the financial sector stability was threatened and we have never seen RBI coming again and again uh, through various forum uh, telling that our banking system is safe, your money is safe. Uh, that was never happened in India before. It, it, what had happened in 2019 and early 2020 before the COVID came. Uh, because of uh, in the, there was a problem in the cooperative segment, there had been problem in some of the uh, private banks, primarily the governance issues. We get to that data maybe at the discussion stage, uh, and of course we had the issue of the public sector banks. And then the government uh, came out with the idea of uh, consolidation in private sector banks. Uh, whether I mean whether it's good or bad, we do not know. Think, things will unfold. But for the time being, I think 21 uh, public sector banks have been compressed into probably 12 or 11. Uh, that's that's what have happened. Another uh, one, uh, one public sector bank is now having the soul of public sector, but the body of a private sector. But now it has, by 2019, I don't have the 2020 data, it's come down one fourth. It's it's about 23, 24 percent. That's 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 the kind of um, you know I'm talking about the incremental share. Uh, incremental share is now it's it's, it's pretty low. Um, so that even though uh, there are problems in the private sector, uh, uh, even though this there is an implicit uh, sovereign government guarantee in in the public sector banking. Uh, but still, uh, you know, uh, people are not even on the deposit sides. Also, uh, it's it's not happening that uh, they're losing their market share. Uh, will consolidation stop it? Will will consolidation make them uh, make them stronger? We do not know yet to see. But consolidation uh, brings down the number of public sector banks, but not the government uh, hold on. So it's not. Uh, 
the problem is probably not uh, with the with the ownership but how the owner behaves uh, that's a separate issue altogether we can discuss at the discussion stage but right now where, where we are uh, public sector banking which was still about uh, four years back 70 percent of the banking industry now has come down dramatically it's in the in the in the 60 in the 60 60 uh, percent plus but incrementally they are far far lower both in terms of deposits as well as in terms of uh, advances um, government is uh, pushing for not pushing for has has already worked on consolidation we need to see how consolidation works uh, this uh, this model whether it's working or not that's about the public sector bank as far as private sector banks are concerned what we are seeing is this uh, some of them um, have problem in terms of governance issues uh, one one uh, one particular bank uh, was almost went belly up and have come to the rescue and but this rescue is very different than what we have seen in the past uh, this rescue is uh, not being taken over by another bank um, by a strong bank and make the strong bank look this rescue is done in a different way uh, they wanted to do a market uh, driven rescue package but uh, uh, sebi norms on pricing came on the way so sbi state bank of india and few others had to step in in a different way uh, it's been done which was not experimented earlier um, so that's that's about the private sector and we were in a situation as as we speak uh, we thought that in the worst is over for the indian banking system um, uh, NPA, the pile of NPA would, would, would start coming down. Uh, the, the phase of recognition of bad loans are over. Uh, we will see uh, actually from now on recovery. That was the kind of situation uh, towards the end of fiscal year 2020, which was ending in March. And we are pretty hopeful that, uh, you know, on the one hand, we have seen uh, it, a decisive uh, government move as far as public sector is concerned. Or what we have seen is this, the budget did not have any any capital, uh, any provision for fresh capital for public sector banks. So government wanted the public sector bank to fend for themselves and it has done its job what it feels the right way whether it's right or wrong that's subject to debate and discussion but the consolidation happened we have seen that uh, private sector banks also um, you know there are um, there are certain issues but they have been ironed out uh, because uh, reserve bank of india stepped in even though it was not exactly on time it was made and we thought that the phase of uh, phase of recognition of bad assets is over now we'll see recovery and bank will come back on their own and, and now uh, the COVID situation has happened, uh, which has actually made all the math uh, gone, you know, haywire, what we are discussing. We heard the RBI governor this morning saying that um, the NPAs have come down further in March 2020, that's the fiscal year 2020, but definitely it would go up. We need to see the how the six month uh, moratorium uh, would work out. Um, so, uh, and uh, governor has repeatedly emphasized that uh, uh, the key takeaway from the COVID situation is uh, the banks need to uh, need uh, it's the NPAs uh, will go up. It's it's given. Uh, banks need to be well governed. Banks needs to take care of their risk management, and all banks need to uh, need to figure out how to raise capital. He repeatedly emphasized this morning that capital is the key uh, for survival and uh, doing well for the banks. And um, so where, you, where, where we are now at this point of time, uh, it's an uncertain time. We need to see how COVID things pans out. Uh, uh, banks were aggressively cleaning up their balance sheets. Uh, we all thought that the worst is behind us, but now the but but now it's a pretty uncertain future. Uh, Reserve Bank of India has come out in June with two important announcements. One is it has created a committee to look into uh, the entire uh, holding structure of uh, new private banks, the ownership structure, and the role of management, so on and so forth. And also it has come out with a discussion paper uh, which talks about the role of the board uh, and some of the key changes that that uh, the RBI wants to be done. Uh, and also this morning I heard, I heard RBI governor saying that uh, the separation between management and ownership uh, will be applicable to large NBFCs as well. Uh, to summarize, uh, we are seeing um, sort of interesting time. We are at a crossroads. Uh, uh, banks have 
cleaned up their balance sheet reasonably well. Uh, their NPAs are pretty uh, have come down um, in the recent past. This is the lowest after a continuous rise. Uh, provision coverage ratio is uh, has gone up. Uh, uh, public sector banks, some of them will have a capital issue, but most of the other banks, including uh, pri most private banks, barring one or two, uh, they are adequately capitalized, but they would need more capital. Uh, Reserve Bank of India uh, has has kept the door for new banks open by making universal banking license uh, uh, on tap. Uh, we have had an, uh, 10 small finance banks, which many of them, or rather most of them are doing pretty well. Um, uh, the payment bank experiment has not done, uh, done well. And so payment banks will be given an option to convert themselves into regular banks after a few years as and when they feel like, and, and, and if the Reserve Bank of India um, uh, thinks that that's the way to do. Uh, so we are, had it been in March, we would have said we definite thing that worst is behind the banking system uh, from now on uh, a better days ahead. But we can't say this because of sudden uh, attack of COVID. Uh, finally, the question I always ask myself that, uh, what is the scenario? Is the, has the banking system let down the nation or it's India has let down the banking system? I think it's both. I think we could have been more liberal in opening up the segment and encouraging competition, allowing more and more banks to come in and allowing some banks to fail uh, so that uh, you know we have enough bank to meet the credit need and and prop up uh, the economy and meet the you know the have the right kind of platform for the economic growth to that extent i think the nation has nation and the regulator you know they have let down the banking system and on the other hand i think the banking system also let down the nation because india is a land of vast opportunities i mean it sounds a little cliche but even after the covid attack we are seeing the, how things are panning out like for instance the rural india we will find we will see the huge opportunities at this point of time uh, we will see some of the shift back to agriculture and other things and all now is our banking system if everybody is capable of doing that we do not know uh, and that brings us to the thing the last part the, the digitalization uh, now is it are we facing a situation where banks will will not be relevant anymore it's the fintech at tech fins uh, the so called fintech and tech fins they will take over uh, to 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 meet the need banking needs of asia's third largest economy i think that's not the case uh, uh, to i'm repeating someone which says that look uh, if uh, you can be a great chef and you need to cook um, uh, chicken. Uh, you, you are given a uh, good uh, good kitchen, uh, you have weighing machine and good spice, uh, a good exhaust, everything is fine. Uh, but can you make a chicken uh, curry without chicken? You can't. Uh, so uh, that's the problem with the tech fin and fintechs. Uh, they can't make the chicken curry even being the best chef because they don't have the chicken themselves and chickens are the customers. So the banks have their customers. So the FinTech and TechFins would need to ride on the banking platform. So to cut a long story short, by itself, looking at our, our financial literacy and geography and demography, FinTechs and TechFins you know, can be the last mile connector, can be the enabler. But India will continue to see the bank uh, the, as an institution relevant and continue to serve the, 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 the need of the economy and the borrowers and everybody else. And FinTech and TechFins can tie up with banks, uh, uh, can, can play the role of an enabler, but they cannot substitute the banks. So I think, uh, yes, we have about 25, 27 minutes, I thought we'd speak. Uh, that's, that's where I end and I'm happy now uh, to take the discussion forward with Ramdev and anybody else who's there and to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bandupadhyay, for your valuable insights. We will now have a Q&A session moderated by MOAMC Head of Research, Mr. Santosh Singh and Mr. Aditya Khemani, the fund manager for MOAMC. Over to you, Aditya and Santosh. 
Thanks, Nidin, and uh, thanks a lot, sir, for your perspective on uh, what's happened in the past and how do you see it going forward. Now, to start uh, with the first question, I would start from the point where you left, actually, taking a cue from where you left. Actually, the place where you left was one part we talked about is last 10 years, how the private sectors have taken market share from PSUs. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and, the, and the new age banking where you're talking about that actually the government should have or the regulator should have been liberal in offering the banking licenses. Now, from that perspective, uh, thinking just about that, last 10 years has also meant that actually private sector banks are not grown, actually they have taken market share, but they have not grown faster than what they did in the last 10 years. Their, the overall economic banking sector growth fell, and a lot of it was taken care of by the NBFCs. So my question will arise from just from a capacity point of view. And when I talk about capacity, it is divided in three parts. One is the operational capacity, that is underwriting capability. Second is the capital position. And third is the deposit base. Now, if I take all these three into account, and if I think from a point of view that would the PSU banks would be relevant because consolidation has happened, would they be relevant after consolidation? Or would it be the private sector banks who will actually provide all these three? Or would it on which the consolidation? I'm not getting into the micro micro details. I think one of the thing is this: this uh, you have the same on the same technology platform. That's that's uh, that's one of the key reasons why the banks have been chosen. And the second thing is the different geographies. But even within the same technology platform, there are different variations. Uh, and from one, uh, there are three at least three variations and from from a to b b to c that transformation takes years so even if you have uh, the three banks on the same tech platform if you are on a on the three versions of the tech platform it doesn't really help you that much other part is this the banks which are left out on what basis they are left out look at iob in chennai or uco bank in in kolkata or, or Bank of Maharashtra in West Bengal and Punjab and Sin in, in, in Northern India. Now, are they great banks? I mean, do they can they survive on their own? If UBI and Allahabad need to be, must be somebody else, why should you be left out? Similarly, if uh, Indian and Vijaya banks will get to know, because Indian and Vijaya bank, they are two relatively better of banks, they need to be matched with others, then why should IOB be left? Now, what is the logic behind them? We really do not know. Uh, so how it will pan out? Will it be able to bring, uh, will it be able to prop up the uh, public sector banking uh, industry? We really don't know because the root of the problem is not the ownership, but how the owner behaves. So unless the owner changes how the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a pattern of behavior, uh, you, you can't, you can't, I mean, should the government be business of banking? I think India is one of the uh, few large economies where the, uh, uh, the presence of government-owned banks is so large. Um, so we, we need to look at this. And we also need to figure, you have asked a very important question. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, will the corporations be allowed to float banks? Uh, I think this is the, uh, this question, uh, different geographies have been asking themselves. There is no specific answer. In Indian case, we know that we had a very strong reservation, particularly Dr. Subarao, when he was the governor, he kept on holding on to it because in 2011, uh, in the union budget, when Pranam Mukherjee, then finance minister, suddenly announced that uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India will open up the banking segment for fresh licenses. I think RBI was not exactly prepared. They were told uh, probably a week in advance that budget is going to make this announcement. And um, and that point of time, RBI's uh, status transfer will not allow the, corp uh, the corporates to get into banking, which is why it took so long. And it came out with uh, with the kind of uh, structure, the so-called holding, hold, you know, three-tier structure. There will be Holdco, there will be an intermediate company, and there will be uh, the ultimately the bank. So RBI wanted to, through the intermediate company, RBI wanted to have a close look at the holding company. Uh, so now RBI has is coming out, uh, the constituted a committee and looking at the holding pattern. And RBI is saying, look, we need to separate management and, and ownership. If that is in place, will RBI change his mind and allow the corporations to, uh, to allow? Probably, yes. yes. I think that, that will be a great service to the economy.
uh, if you allow the corporates with proper checks and balances, you separate the management and ownership. Uh, then they have the bis, uh, they have the capital in their kitty. Uh, they have the bis, big risk-taking ability. And I repeat what I said is this: we need more banks because unless you have competition, you can't you can't get a better service, uh, which you don't have. Look at the way we have opened up the banking sector. In 1993-94, we gave two, 10 banking licenses, including one cooperative bank got converted. Not all of them survived. We waited for 10 years. 2003-04, we gave two licenses. We waited for another 10-11 years. 2015, we gave two more licenses. And then suddenly, of course, we saw differentiated banking, uh, uh, the payment bank and, and the small finance banks. And now we are at a situation where RBI is stepping uh, back and looking at the entire structure, how the, the separation of ownership and management and the entire, uh, how it would be structured because it kept on changing uh, at various times and which prompted actually uh, one particular private sector bank uh, to move court against the regulator, which has never happened before. Because what was the original licensing uh, terms and there it was changed. So I think RBI is taking a look at it, uh, the committee, and we need to wait. But we'll be very happy if with proper checks and balances, large houses allowed uh, entry into banking. I think we need more banks. We need competition. Um, otherwise, this financial repression will continue. So, sir, just on that point, because one of the things you talked about was still uh, privatization. Right? That was, let's say, last six, seven years. Now, in a way, that has to an extent not worked because uh, these were part of the stealth privatization and they are suddenly, uh, they are the ones for last two years which are causing much stress in the system than anything else. Now, so do you think that rather than doing stealth privatization and, con and consolidation and again trying to do the same thing, would you think that the government might privatize some of its PSA? Basically, to take care of the situation like what we have now, COVID. Uh, 19 and another situation also. This is basically to um, you know to serve the purpose uh, of the government. And the rest of them, you need to figure out what needs to be done. I mean, why not privatization? Because um, uh, mm -hmm. you know they have the right kind of. Uh, I mean, anybody would give their right hand to get a franchise of a public sector max. So why not? I mean, instead of uh, in, in uh, and you can. Uh, Again, uh, I think this year's uh, economic survey uh, mentioned that there was a, a few paragraphs that uh, uh, government recapitalization versus government return. And had the same money put in in, 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 in private banks, how much returns government would have made. I mean, uh, you, can, you can plot it with the Nifty Banking uh, Index and you look at this, how much actually for every rupee government has put in how many paisa it's return and how many how much would have been in a, in a private in in a private bank so if uh, we are talk, we, we do talk about our fiscal deficit and it will get widened uh, now in the current regime for two reasons one is this the revenue will be hurt uh, the government will not get as much revenue as it as, as it should have got in the normal circumstances and second is the government spending even though we have been talking about only 1% of gdp is being spent in the COVID package, uh, but we have to see, we just completed only the first quarter, there are three more quarters left. So there'll be more government spending and then fiscal deficit will go up definitely. So if we are concerned about that, why not have an experiment uh, uh, with uh, with private privatizing with some of the um, uh, public sector banks? That's 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 probably the right way to do. I mean, what 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 harm it makes? I mean, you you keep a few public sector banks for the purpose, and you can free some of them. Sure, sir. Uh... So next question is on the regulatory landscape. You touched a bit in your speech. So uh, you mentioned whether the regulator has let down the banking system. So in a country like US, it has 40,000 banks, but in India, we have not more than 50 banks. So you think, why do you think RBI has been so cagey in terms of not allowing competition? And is that changing for the better in the years to come? One is that, secondly, sir, in terms of you touched about the segregation of ownership with management and also uh, tenure of a CEO. Which is why uh, national housing banks, then now the regulation part has been taken away. It is going to result in 
if you have seen the past few years uh, it was pretty liberal in giving licenses i think from from 70s uh, till june 2019 uh, till the time nhb was the regulator uh, it uh, went up to 99 uh, hfcs uh, and now i think it's 102 uh, so there is a the huge number of hfcs and they actually uh, to a large extent uh, what happened is this uh, to the to the extent uh, they are exposed to micro housing and and they are exposed to the builders and other real estate developers uh, it was it was not exactly balanced and that's what the that's what the problem started uh, now reserve bank of india has taken care of i mean taken over that particular role and rbi has come out with a discussion paper again on that uh, what, what should be the what should be the balance sheet structure uh, of the of of the hfcs uh, second part of happened is this uh, the uh, the sort um, you know uh, the thorn in the flesh in the indian financial system the the cooperative banks uh, since independence they have been uh, dual control reserve bank of india as well as the respective state government now that has been taken care of now it has come out with the it, it, it clearly with reserve bank uh, and now we are uh, seeing that RBI also looking into other aspects, as uh, such as management, separation of management and and uh, uh, ownership and so on and so forth. We need to wait. Uh, so we are getting into a sort of full service uh, central banks, um, uh, multiple uh, multiple job, and RBI also needs to probably you know it needs to develop its own skill. Where is the market intelligence of Reserve Bank? Why have, why have we seen so many frauds, whether it's Punjab National Bank or, uh, or, the, or the cooperative banks? Uh, because Reserve Bank of India shifted to risk-based supervision and almost uh, we were doing away with that uh, you know, transaction testing. Uh, RBI needs to come back with the transaction testing. Otherwise, uh, there will be frauds. Uh, can you eliminate frauds? You can't, but you can minimize fraud if you do transaction testing, which Reserve Bank of India virtually stopped. So while the banking system, banking landscape is set to change, uh, and uh, and we need uh, the the large corporations, probably we will welcome them because they have the risk-taking ability, they have the capital, and they can infuse competition. We also need to uh, uh, we need to see the regulator also you now living up to the expectation and the team new new role. I think we don't have a we, we we are not a we don't have a reluctant regulator, but we have a, we till recently we had a pretty reticent regulator. I think RBI needs to uh, needs to look at um, itself and it sees the, it needs to ask the question: Does it need to iron its own clothes or need to uh, you know get out of the old robes and need new clothes? So along with the new banking landscape. We also need to have a regulator, uh, which which needs some kind of soul searching and change itself, which is already started, uh, like you know specialized kind of so on and so forth. Uh, that that's the regulation part and the new landscape. Part. Other part, what you are saying, it's a very very critical part, um, like uh, the longer the long tenure. Now let's not compare Aditya Puri and Uday Kotar because Uday Kotar is a owner manager and Aditya Puri is a professional manager. But in Indian context, and probably in the banking globally, it's not the bank, the banker that matters. You know, if you look at this globally also, it is the banker. So from a, from an investor's point of view, uh, they, 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 they don't bet on bank, they, don't, they bet on the bankers. And they're the CEOs will uh, come in the picture. But nowhere in the world, you will find that a CEO is at the saddle for 25 years. Now, is it good or bad? I'm not getting into that because Aditya Puri, by any year, stick is the one of the finest bankers India has produced. But Aditya Puri and HDFC Bank, they are synonymous. They are not. And now RBI is deciding that uh, no, uh, we need to, we, we we can't continue with that. It has, it is planning to cap the how many years one can have, irrespective of. I mean, one is the owner uh, manager and one is the even the managers. Uh, but definitely one can't have this kind of 25 year runs. So I think, um, and globally it doesn't happen. As I said, even though investors look at banker, not bank, they, they, bank, they bank on the banker more than the bank, but nowhere in the world you see 
such a long uh, tenure so what does this mean that means that i think uh, it's a time now uh, however uh, however uh, competent you are i think the succession planning needs to happen and it's globally it happens uh, wh why doesn't happen in india i do not know and that's not about banking even i will not name even the corporations and non banking also i mean you find that uh, there are uh, ceos who have pretty long 20 30 years in inns uh, which is uh, which is uh, which which is uh, globally you don't see this uh, so i think uh, i think we are again as a, at a crossroads not at uncertain uncertainty apart from that uh, we are while well, you talking at a time there are structural changes going to happen and the banks need to change uh, themselves how to operate the role of the board of directors need to change and uh, one thing is sort of uh, no bank as least officially done it uh, is the uh, succession planning uh, uh, like for instance in 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 uh, hdfc bank we hear the three names have gone and Uh, if i'm not mistaken number one name is sashi jagdishan who is an insider number two as an insider and number three is a city banker now rbi takes a look at it and rbi typically does not distinguish the between one and two and three it doesn't look at the capability of one and and see is it be one versus a versus b if a fits in the fit and proper criteria then a gets the tick mark so by that logic i would like to believe sashi jagdishan will be made the next ceo of hdfc bank now it's not deviation from the tradition because he is from the same school uh, because he worked with uh, mr puri for the last 20 years so we would like to believe that he would carry forward the same thing but was he identified as successor long before no it did not happen and all we know that in the past few months uh, there were there were uh, there were um, you know uh, head hunters appointed and looking for uh, the successor so on and so forth but ideal situation would be the bankers the the ceo with the board mm -hmm. identify the successor that's what globally happens if you look at any of the bankers any of the global banks i will not name uh, institutional instances well in advance the investors know who will take over who is the next person mm -hmm. there's no uncertainty there i think Try. we are now coming to a situation where we where, where we will see that Sure. So we have last uh, three four minutes, and just slip a couple of one question here. So and it will uh, actually we will take it from where you left. That is uh, the investors bank on the bankers and not on the bank. Now if I look at the entire banking space and where actually all the investors would have made money, all the bankers either have changed or are changing in the private sector bank. So. That's one part. That how do you see this change? And um, because you would have met, you would have talked with them for so many years with the new bankers who are coming in. How do you think this change will impact the banking system? And just to uh, uh, carry forward from that, do you think amongst them there is another Aditya Puri somewhere? Well, how it will change? As I said, Sashi belongs to Aditya Puri school. So will he change? I would not like to believe that he will change himself. that that's the that's the one part of it uh, it will not change because he will carry on the same tradition i i would like to believe had been somebody else it would have been a, it, it would have been a very challenging uh, assignment and you tell me hand on heart why would anybody take on uh, this kind of responsibility the upside is very limited because you know uh, to what extent the money you can get if you are looking for a real international figure why would they come for the kind of compensation this so the only compensation you can get compensation is through to market to raising the market cap and to what extent you can continue to do this 20% or uh, that kind of growth quarter after quarter for so this is a very very challenging thing and all so i think uh, insider to that extent i think gives a continuity um, that's one part. so there's a there's a huge talent shortage there's a talent shortage and at this point of time again if you have seen that uh, some of the private sector banks have been run by in uh, by persons whose immediate experience was in insurance now they were banker getting in insurance coming back to banking or some of them uh, uh, one of them is primarily an insurance person so i think going forward what we will see is again it's not necessarily the bankers need to run banks 
if you come from the allied field in the thing because i mean at the end of the day it's a very boring business you know i mean if you take i take your money and give it to him and keeping a spread and giving the risk that uh, you return my money i mean this fellow returns my money so that i can return your money so the problem in india is not too many guy in banking what you don't do is more important than what you do but unfortunately many of the banks forget that and they want to do lot of things which they should not do at all so that's other part and another thing is this uh, which uh, a few private sector bankers at least two of them repeatedly say it from various fora the banking is a liability business at the end of the day because in a country like india i mean there is no doubt of assets you 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 throw a stone it will hit a borrower but the problem is you you get the right kind of liability and the right kind of pricing so if you do that and then you can build your assets accordingly you know uh, so how to how to get the right liabilities at the right pricing and how to not to do things which one should not do in other words how to make it a very boring business that's the key to success of a banking i think that uh, probably what we see is this yeah the era of aditya puri will get over in october um uh, we don't know about um, uh, mr kotex but i think we we will see uh, a churn in the system uh, we will see probably uh, people from we have already started seeing people from allied fields um, coming into banking and also we will see more responsible board and succession planning which has not happened Uh, either in public sector or in private sector, um, um, there is no success in planning in Indian banks. I think with the Reserve Bank of India uh, taking this movement, looking into these issues, I think banks will have no choice but to start success in planning, which is the international norm. Sure, sir. Well, thanks a lot, sir, uh, for this and uh, it was wonderful as always hearing you and listening to you and getting new things out of it. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, Thank you. and uh, stay safe. That's the two word. <laughs> This is the time to uh, to say nothing else. Thank you for for inviting me, and all of you, your audience, everybody, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Daman. Well, I thought you would come. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Mandupadhyay, for your time. Thank you, Aditya and Santosh.